Okay, so we're going to shift gears here. We're going to start talking about um, uh, another coastal wetland uh, complex, and this is the Magoo Ormond complex. Now, we currently talk about today, we talk about Magoo Lagoon, the military base area, and Ormond Beach, the area just uh, westward of the military base and uh, uh, towards the city of Oxnard. Indeed, some of this is, is actually within the city limits of Oxnard. Um, we talk about those as distinct systems. They really aren't. Um, even though we politically have them segregated at the moment, um, they really are one cohesive whole. So I like to talk about them as the Magoo Ormond complex. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, first thing, though, just as a, a bit of a background, oops, well, sorry a minute, is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, why we would care about the coast. This really applies to Malibu and, and so many places of our coastal wetland sites. But because Ormond is so tightly associated with the beach as well, I want to just talk a little bit about why we might care um, for uh, doing a restoration in this particular site or, or um, in particular um, uh, doing management to, to preserve this part of the, uh, our, our coastal ecosystem. Then I want to spend um, a good amount of time, perhaps the bulk of our time, talking about what we mean by reference or what we mean by history. And uh, then we'll go into a little bit of a discussion about um, how monitoring might help us frame what a reference, what reference conditions are, or what, what historical conditions are, and then start in on the historical overview of Magoo Ormond. Again, we might just pause after the monitoring thing and, and pick this up next week, given, um, given situations in my house at the moment. Um, okay, so uh, here, here's a real uh, briefly about why we might want to care about these systems other than the fact that you're in a restoration ecology class other than you're you're thinking about conserving wetlands um, and this is some old data now this economic data is notoriously variable so uh, you know a lot of it is sort of estimates and calculations and indirects and things of that nature but suffice it to say we spend billions of dollars on our um, or we reap billions of dollars every year from our sandy beaches at, at, mo across California, but in particular in Southern California. So we could talk about how we get to this number, but the first thing you can just measure directly taxes, how, how, many, how many taxes are collected from within the area at the beach or just next to the beach, say next to Ormond or next to Malibu, um, state taxes, uh, et cetera. And then we could talk about how much we invest in keeping these coastal systems really, in the case of beaches, nourished, keeping sand on them, et cetera. And while this varies from year to year, this is really, you know, this is, it's, it's orders of magnitude less are invested um, relative to how much we, we reap the benefit of. So that, that's a strong argument, I would say, that um, there's reason to pay attention to these systems and reason to make sure these systems are well functioning, right? And, and sometimes the debate, such as what's going on now and last night with some of our political leaders and stuff. Um, there's this notion of, well, how much is taxes or how much is this gonna cost? And of course those are relevant questions to ask, but the disparity here is what I wanna focus on, right? It's, order, it's many, many orders of magnitude more value we get out than we invest in these systems. So, so even though an investment might, on the face of it seem like it might cost a lot of dollars and it could indeed cost, you know, millions of dollars, let's say, but relative to the, the benefit of a healthy system, relative to the, um, the functioning that we get out of this system, it's really minimal. And so I think it's important to talk about when you're having conversations with the wider public. Uh, yeah, we can skip that. Um, and we can just say we're more and more people living in the coast. Um, this is some data from 2014, which is the very first year we started studying sandy beaches at Ormond and elsewhere. Um, but when we ask folks, uh, and this is from our coastal opinion data, and some of you that are in um, uh, Capstone are working on this data for uh, your, your Capstone project. But suffice it to say, in this year, in 2014, the year we started this, this uh, focus in this area. Um, actually, I've been working on it before, but, but when our program started focusing on this area, 78% um, of the people said the last open space they visited was in the immediate coastal zone. And some of that was, say, Santa Monica Mountains or something of that nature. But 61%, so it's about two thirds of the public specifically said that when the last open space they went to was the beach. So in the case of Orman, that's a, that's a complex of salt marsh, salt flats, sandy beach, et cetera. Um, and, and people do all kinds of stuff. People walk, sunbathe, et cetera. 
um, many things of which are completely compatible with a healthy wetland, a healthy coastal functioning system. Indeed, a healthy coastal functioning system would actually improve those opportunities, make it easier to walk, make there be more birds to see when you walk, make the water quality healthier when you swim, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so in general, when we talk about resource management, this, is, this goes for all ESRMs, this is not just ecological restoration. Um, in general, we wanna ask the question, is there a problem, first and foremost? Is there a problem? If there isn't a problem, we don't need to do anything. Uh, number two is if there is a problem, we want to stop the bleeding, right? So you can imagine if, if, if the analogy is a, is a, is me and I've been in a car accident. First thing is, is you come up to me after the car accident, is there a problem? So you're going to assess me. Oh my gosh, I'm unconscious or something like that. Okay. So there's a problem. And then what's going on? Oh my God, look, my arm is cut and I'm bleeding out of that arm. So the first thing is let's stop the bleeding. Okay. So before we move me, before we, before we, you deal with the car and the road and all that kind of stuff, it's stop the initial stressor, stop the initial problem. Once, only once those two things are done, can we actually go to actually healing the damage, which we talk about as ecological restoration. So even though our focus in this class is the doing of the restoration, we really need to make sure we understand the problem and how to stop the problem first. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to go ahead with that uh, restoration in the first place. Um, so, uh, is there a problem? Um, so, the, how might we know if there's a problem? There's a couple different ways. Um, we could uh, compare it to a reference condition. We could uh, just talk to a bunch of super smart people or super experienced people and say, hey, based on your knowledge, is there something weird with this system? Expert opinion type of an approach. And then, uh, a thirdly, the way we could figure out if, if there is a problem or how, how um, a big a priority of the problem is, is in the context of the rest of our palette of area that we're interested in. So if we're um, talking about, if we're in charge of Ventura County, let's say, or we're in charge of California, we might need to, to look at the problem in the, in the context of other stressors and maybe other things need to be addressed first. But I would say the most common one that people talk about is, is measuring our system's performance to some reference performance, some reference condition. And so that's a key thing that, that, that of all these things, that's by far the most important way we know, uh, other than if you know a meteor land and just outright destroyed the whole thing, um, using reference conditions are the most um, common approach to determining if there is or isn't a problem. Okay, so what do we mean by a reference condition? Um, well, why don't I ask you first, why don't you guys toss out some, um, just flick on your mic and toss out a couple uh, reference condition ideas or, or, or what might be something we might want to measure to compare and contrast our system to see if it's doing okay. Anybody? Uh, diversity. Water quality. Okay, okay biological oxygen. diversity, water quality. Cool, somebody else said something? Dissolved oxygen. Okay, so another water quality parameter. Okay, cool, good. Abundance. I'm sorry, what was the last one? Abundance. Oh, but okay, so so how many organisms are in this area relative to some other site? Okay, cool, good. What else? Migratory birds. Okay, 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 migratory species, good. And then Loretta, I didn't hear what you said. Invasive species. Okay, good. So things that maybe um I, that that's might be another example of abundance, let's say. But in this case, it wouldn't be uh, the the goal wouldn't be to have a lot, but the goal would be to have minimum or none. So okay, good. So so Problematic organisms, the presence. Uh -huh. if it's Ecological functions. Services. Ecological functions. Good. Tell me more specifically. So, so totally, but give me give me a specific example or two about ex ecological functions so that you want to measure. Uh, nutrient cycling. Okay. Good. I like it. I like it. And somebody else was saying something that I got we got talked over. I apologize. I was saying ecosystem services, so kind of kind of on the same thing. Okay. Yeah, very good. So I like that. So that's so. Um, remember, I have a slide in a little bit, but but just as a quick summary, um, uh, ecosystem services. There's functions and values. Functions being the what the system does, the biochemistry, 
the ecology, right? The, the, the system that would, that's doing its due with people not around. Uh, the valuation is the worth you and I, as members of our society, derive from that going on. So both of those are totally valid things to look at. I mean, they're, they're ultimately different sides of the same coin, but we typically measure them in distinct ways. So a lot of things people have talked about so far, uh, you know, water quality, abundance of organisms, we could, we could put those in the, um, the functioning category. The valuation might be something like um, how many school groups use the site as a, as a place to play or as a field trip location. How many um, fisher, how many people that, that get a fishing license um, pay the state a fishing license in a local, local um, you know, big five or local sporting goods store? to then go out and fish in that area or that bought binoculars to go watch birds or, or, you know, something of that nature. So cool. Okay. So, uh, so what is a reference conditions? Well, it could be, could be a couple different things. First and foremost, we could have a a priori reference condition. So that is the reference condition before we start studying this uh, intensively, right? So this is, this is, um, it can be a guess, and oftentimes it's a guess. Again, we're focusing on wetlands here, not exclusively in our class, but we're primarily focusing on wetlands. And that's, you know, probably the best studied ecosystem in the context of restoration um, of, of any systems in the world, basically, um, with the possible exception of forests, but I would argue we have a better handle than on the forests. But, um, uh, but, but even with that, even with this real, relatively well-studied um, ecosystem in the context of restoration, there's still tons we don't know. So oftentimes we're forced into an a priori setting. And so we can get to that, that level of function. Let's say it's 50% uh, cover of pickleweed, something like that. Now we can get that from a guess, right? Uh, just you know, kind of, we visited a bunch of wetlands and we think, okay, you know, da, 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 this, this seems to be about what would be good, right? Um, so in effect, a guess. Um, or we could have gone through some modeling exercise and predicted for this particular site, given X, given Y, given Z, we think it should have uh, 65, at least 65% cover of pickleweed historically let's say, or something like that. So that would be a, a, a model prediction. Again, neither of those is coming from us having spent any, any extensive time or doing any extensive studies in the site. So a priori approach. The next approach to um, figuring out what a reference condition might be is, is probably the most widely used. And that's the historical condition. So what was it like before, right? Uh, and usually when we say before, we mean before it was disturbed by people. In our case, before it was disturbed by, typically we mean being disturbed by European settlers. Um, another approach we can take to figuring out what our reference condition should be, our desirous condition, our measurement, our, our ruler by which we assess our system, is um, the only thing we have left. So, okay you know, things have changed a lot. So therefore, I'm going to say, uh, you know, 1980 or something might be a better target as opposed to 1950, or as opposed to 1900, or as opposed to 1850. For example, um, we shot the last grizzly bear in California in 1934. So the grizzly bear used to be all throughout here, right? It used to be on campus, used to be in the Santa Monica Mountains, used to be in Malibu, used to be in Santa Barbara, used to be up in San Francisco, Monterey, all over the place. One of the main thing, or one of the frequent things they fed on was dead marine mammals on the beach. So grizzly bears feeding on the beach. Um, no more grizzly bears, right? Now, historically, that was the undisturbed state, right? So a grizzly bear could, you know, was historically part of our wetland ecosystem. Now they're big animals, probably a little bit hard to move through the mud. But nevertheless, at least around the periphery and stuff, absolutely they were, they were here and doing stuff. 
So if you took the, the pure historical approach, you would say, you could say, well, you know, we need grizzly bears here. But we might say, mm, you know, I don't think we're gonna get grizzly bears anytime soon here. So maybe while that could very well be true historically, maybe that's not what we wanna use as a reference condition. Maybe we wanna pick a more uh, quote unquote best available or realistic uh, situation. And then another one that's, that's uh, used a lot is um, this notion of best professional judgment. This is kind of related to a priori. So what this is, this is usually a bunch of people um, like me, professor types, older folks from consulting firms, a few folks from agencies, stuff like that. Uh, maybe a few uh, nonprofits and activists folks that have extensive experience in the system will get called together and form a science advisory panel. And the idea is, um, uh, uh, you know, what do we think as a, as a collective whole of experts, what do we think we want to do in terms of um, uh, this restoration? What, what, should, what should the design be? What should our measurement things be, et cetera? So, uh, so we can get a reference condition or we can, we can figure out what a reference condition is or, or agree upon what our conditions might be or the rule stick any one of these four ways. A priori, historical, best available, professional judgment. And I should also say that a priori can also just be random folks from the community that just have a gut feeling. So you get that as well, um, which would fall under the a priori um, uh, uh, category. Does that make sense? Questions about that so far? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you go back one second? Um, so instead of, I wouldn't be looking for non, for a non-native species, I would be looking for a native species to compare in that first um, model prediction or guess. Yeah, you okay. could, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So again, at this level, at this level, it, it, this, this could apply to anything. This could apply to invasive species, this could have applied to um, um, ease of transitioning through the site, this could have applied to um, food provisioning, you know, how, how many, how much fish we can, how many fish we take out of the city. It can apply to anything. This is, this is a generic thing, but yes, you're, you're correct. Okay. Other questions? All right, great. So again, reference condition, how are we going to figure this out, right? Sounds kind of simple. In relatively intact, um, well-functioning systems, this, this can be really easy, right? So here we have this really vibrant coral head on this coral reef. We have this great, you know, forest. We have this grassland over here. You know, that's like, okay, it's, it's pretty easy to see that. And, and we can say that this is different than this, right? Than this human dominated landscape, this heavily urban area, this intensely, you know, agricultural suburban matrix there, an area with intense road networks, right? So that's really, so in this case, it's very easy to see that this particular place differs from the, the natural reference condition. Everybody with me? Um, so this obvious degradation is super easy. And again, the Walmart parking lot, the, um, the, the meteor crater, right? It's okay, it's, that's messed up. Not, we don't always have it that simple though. So then the question comes in, what is natural? And again, as we mentioned, we, when we talked about our implicit biases or implicit assumptions, um, oftentimes when folks like you and I say, is that natural? What we really mean is, is that good? Is that desirous, right? It's what our assumption is about what is a, a, a desirous state. Um, in practice, this, we start to measure things, we, often start coming to the question, or, or, or in effect, we're asking the question, is this place degraded in some way, shape, or form? And that's going to depend on our metric. So can you guys give me some examples of, of, of measures for how natural something is? Or, 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 or let me say it differently, how degraded it is? Maybe some of those things you already suggested, like, like DO, et cetera. Invasive species again. Okay, so not so things that aren't supposed to, things that weren't historically in the site, that um, that got to the site directly or indirectly because of human activity. 
Okay, so the, so so in the in the presence of those organisms indicate that something is quote unquote not natural or is quote unquote degraded. Okay, other things. Um, other maybe ideas? like oh, go ahead, go ahead Chris. Oh, okay, uh, maybe like a like a monoculture of some kind. Like you look out and you just see one of only like only one thing and okay. like it only looks like one thing's thriving but like you know that it's it should be more diverse okay good so we mentioned uh in our our tour uh last week at malibu that you know knowing nothing else and oftentimes we don't know what we all the stuff we'd like to know heterogeneity is usually um a default thing to apply in your restoration so so topographic heterogeneity, elevational heterogeneity, uh, a heterogeneity of your, of your planting pallets, um, um, inundation frequency, uh, a size of the little island you're making, right? All those things tend to introduce variation and that's usually a good thing. It's, it's usually not the case unless we just had a lava flow or something like that, that we have a, 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 a massive area that is, um, uniform in in the in natural systems so that's a good one other other ideas other thoughts decreased biological activity okay maybe like decreased growth rates or something like that maybe mm -hmm. okay okay good yeah so so again so decreased is good but we have to put that up against something so that's cool but but then one of the challenges with that so that I've, I, I like that as an idea that's a great idea but um the most or well the most productive in terms of bio, biomass growing per unit area per hour, um, the, the most productive systems in the world are either, um, depending on how you measure it, uh, kelp reefs, you know, large kelp reefs at, at sort of the um, early midsummer time period in temperate areas of the world, particularly places like California, or wetlands. Wetlands are highly productive systems. But I usually have to throw the caveat that I say natural systems because actually the most productive system just purely in terms of measurement of biomass accrued per unit area. Any guesses as to what the most, uh, most productive ones of those is on the planet? It's actually a human dominated system. It's a human system. Sugar cane. So sugar cane actually will, will fix more carbon and, 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 and get more um, photosynthate material turned into physical tissue um, on a per unit area basis, a slightly higher than some of the most productive wetlands or slightly higher or very similar to kelp beds. So, so, so the idea of um, oftentimes, most of the time, we act to nuke things, right? We, we, our human activities act to degrade productivity. But there are cases where humans have higher productivity or we could take an area that, um, at least in the short term, had relatively low biomass and then introduce a weed that's really tall, let's say, and that weed could actually produce higher biomass. So the degraded system might have higher productivity. So great idea, but we have to be careful with that one. Other, other ideas? Other ideas about um, measures of, of naturalness or degradedness? The ecosystem's ability to be resilient. Mm. Excellent, excellent. So, so our whole Earth system, right, is this funky, stable thing, right? It's almost like a, almost like a chamber where we're growing bacteria in, right? That that we it tends to be self-regulating within, uh, you know, pretty pretty decent range. Um, and one of the challenges with climate change is we seem to be changing changing that, the the ability to. Um, uh, be resilient at, at, at the planetary scale. But yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. We would love to have a wetland or a grassland or a forest or whatever. Love to be able to poke it, maybe poke with a little wildfire, poke it with a little earthquake, poke it with a little invasive species and might get tweaked for a bit, but then we'd love to see it be, you know, pop back and, and not require any work from us and, and be a resilient thing. So that's, a, that's an excellent one. And that's one that I think people are increasingly using. We haven't historically used it that much but in the future, it's, it's very much becoming an increasingly popular approach to this, to this topic. So that's great. Other ideas? Maybe like species succession, like there's different generations of 
like different types of plants or animals so you know that they're thriving in the area. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so, so that's almost a, a bit like the resiliency in the sense that um, the, the system can continue on the path, a trajectory, right? In the case of resiliency, it's like sort of stability. But Casey's talking about maybe um, the idea that even if it's knocked off its path a little bit, it'll return to the course that it was, that it was on. So that's good. I like that. Other ideas? Okay. Okay. Um, I would say that uh, these are all good. Um, so here's a couple quotes um, from uh, folks talking about uh, restorations and restoration planning and, and, and what should we be, you know, what should our goal be for our restoration? So this first one uh, comes from this person many years ago uh, in a meeting I was at and, and, and uh, this person said, it's so sad how things have changed. We need to get back to how things were when I was a kid, right? Because back then they were rocking and rolling. Uh, I think, and so that, that's a member of the public was saying that to me. Um, the other one, the second quote here is a more, the kind of thing we'd see in a formal report, you know, a consultant report or, or a, an assessment of a project or getting ready to do a pro project. And here the idea is, hey, we want to um, do this restoration such that we, when we're done with it, our system is restored to pre-disturbance levels. Okay, so, so both of these things relate to um, something current that seems to have, have gone awry. So, something in recent years, our system has, has gotten tweaked in some way, shape, or form, right? So the, the first one says, you know, let's make up an age. Let's say this guy's 50 years old. Let's say it was a guy and say it was 50 years old. Um, so then, you know, this person wants to take it back to the conditions 50 years ago. This other one says pre-disturbance levels, but it's not specific, but presumably it's, it's specifically referencing some, some recent disturbances that have happened. So this is what I always show. So my son is a senior in high school now, so you can tell this is an old picture. And this is back when we were up in the Bay Area. But so this is uh, our house up uh, in San Francisco uh, all those years ago. And uh, check it out. When I, well, I showed you guys, did I show you guys? I can't remember if it was this class or my other class. I showed you guys my office upstairs. So you might now think that this is very clean. But, uh, but compared to with my wife, my wife likes to have things clean, right? Because she's an adult and she's professional and things. She's not like an immature person like me. Um, and so normally our house was super, super clean. Everything was super clean. And then we had our son. And now our son's in the picture. And very quickly, very, very quickly, what was... Um, what was considered acceptable changed. So this then became the new clean. So check it out, there's a, there's a pile of Lego things with a Winnie the Pooh or something on the floor. There's some kind of other crate on the floor. There's these, there's these Thomas the Tank Engine trains all around. There's some stuff in the back, right? Why is this clean? Because there aren't any diapers around because there isn't, isn't any spilled food sitting around, right? So of course this is clean, right? If you didn't have kids or whatever, and you walked, came into our house, you'd say, what the hell? You know, this huge, huge bomb went off. This place is a mess, right? But, but to us, it was like, what are you talking about? It's, it's great, it's super clean. Our, per, our, our perception of what was desirous, our perception of what the reference condition was shifted. So here we go. So here is, uh, let, let's jump over to um, Southern Europe now. So we're on the, the northern edge of Italy, this mountain chain that's, that's stretching from as far as we can see, big alpine passes, right? And this is in 1991. 1991, some, uh, I think they were German, I have to remember, but I think they're German hikers. We're out hiking because they're German, right? So they gotta go hiking. And uh, summertime, and they're, they're hiking through the, this, um, this, pa the, the, this, this uh, valley area. They come up and they, they round a corner and they see a dead dude. And they say, oh my God, uh, let's get this guy out. And he he's, looks like he died in the previous winter. He's you know, a little bit dried out, but, he, but he's, he's you know normal looking dude and everything. And so they grab a stick, uh, you know, a sort of tree branch next to him, jab the tree branch in trying to pry the guy out of the snow and it, they break the, break the stick and they're like, oh my God, I've got to get help. So they eventually go get help and you know, bring the authorities. And it turns out it wasn't a dude that just died. It was this guy, it was Otzi. It was a dude that died about 5,300 years before. Um, 
and and so YBP is years before present. Um, so uh, and now he's called Otzi or the Ice Man in English, and uh, there's a whole museum dedicated to him now in um, in in Italy. And uh, he's now in a climate controlled room and all this kind of stuff. And there's been all this really cool analysis that's been done. Now he was super well preserved. Um, now he might not, he might, he might look kind of Halloween-y to you guys down there, but you know, for, I, I would argue that, you know, if you died 5,000 years before, you probably wouldn't look quite as good as this uh, individual did. So he was frozen in this glacier, which is why he was so preserved so well. And uh, and the cold and the the sealing off from air really um, helped preserve him. So now he's in this in this chamber that has all this inert gas in it, and everything's controlled and everything. But one of the interesting things, and so what we think happened, and so, and so I should say, when the thing that the stick they grabbed was was a bow, I think, and uh, so they we grabbed a stick and snapped a five thousand year old bow or six thousand year old bow, whatever the heck it was. Um, so, um, anyway, oops, but, but, uh, not only did they find the bow, but he had clothes, he had clothing on, he had all this kind of cool stuff. And so from this, we've been able to learn a few things. Okay. So this is five, this is more than 5,000 years ago in Europe. So what are the, some of the things we could learn? Well, check it out. He had this, this cloak, uh, of, of one type of grass. Uh, he had his she had leather shoes and and keeping the leather shoes onto his feet was this uh, middle picture here, which is this woven uh, reed, this woven woven grass into a little fibrous rope, hemp kind of rope that that acted as a mesh to hold his his uh, shoes on. Inside that leather was stuff the stuff on the left, which was other uh, grasses and herbs that make essentially padding to make his feet be uh, both a little bit of padding, but probably also thermally insulate him from the, the cold air and things of that nature. Um, and then uh, he had a food pouch. So we could see what kind of food he was growing. And actually they've cut into his stomach and, and looked at some of the contents of his, of his gut. And so in the middle there with the little green uh, square around it, He's, he's, we're essentially uh, evidence that these folks have been cultivating grasses, oats, barley, wheat, stuff like that. So just from this one individual, we have evidence of the species of plant on the right, sp species of plant in the middle being selected and bred. We have um, uh, the, the cord on the foot, a third example, and on the fourth example, all the, the various uh, plant material that's been stuffed in his, in his boots. So already, 5,000 years ago, people were potentially impacting the, commun the, the vegetative communities around them. Now, was, was there a billion people and were they you know, operating all throughout Europe? No, of course not. But certainly in the localized areas where this gentleman lived and his, his community lived, there's a decent chance they could have been shifting some of the distribution of of these organisms, right? Certainly they're, they're doing, performing that um, artificial selection on the plants, on the food plants. They're, they could well be uh, shifting some of at least the local distribution of the abundance of these reeds and grasses and things of that nature. So we humans have been altering ecosystems for a very long time, intentionally and unintentionally. So then we get to this uh, uh, slide. So here we go. So this isn't a wetland, but this is, this is a, uh, example I use a lot. So here's my question: healthy community, and, and so these are all these are pictures taken from the same exact um, uh, location at, at different points in time. So is this a healthy community, or is this? What do you guys think? A or B? It's like going to the eye doctors, right? It's like A, B. Once again, A or B. So okay, so so A. Or B. So since I'm since I have my screen share on everything, it's a little hard to see the chat. So I want to I want to uh, just a, a chime in if you think A is the healthy community. A. And B. E. E. B. B. Also, there's a lot of people in the chat that said B as well, Doctor Anderson. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. 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 Okay. So okay, Loretta's Loretta's apparently our lone A represent Loretta like that, right? Not afraid to go, not afraid to cut a different course. That's great. Um, uh, but okay, anybody else besides Loretta say A? 
Okay, Loretta, why, why did you say A? Why did you think this was the, the quote unquote healthier system of the two? Because there's so many more trees and stuff there. Perfect, right? That's a total natural thing, right? So we just were saying, we just mentioned abundance, right? If we have more things, that's probably a, a better condition or, or, or better functioning. So somebody, somebody that said B, why did they, why did who say B or why did you pick B? Because that's what the ecosystem uh, looks like with fire, like natural fire uh, over, over the years. Okay. Yeah, that, that's basically correct. Um, this is the answer. So the bottom one was a picture of uh, something. The, the B, B is this one right here in 1874. Right, so as Nathan was talking about, this is actually from the Sierras. And we can see that uh, the, there's relatively sparse trees. This is 1964 after, uh, you know, about 60, 70 years of active fire suppression in the Sierras. And then this little inset right here, this was actually the same picture in 1994. We can't, well, actually, we should, I should check in the last couple of years. One of these fires might have cleared it out. But um, you, I can't show you a picture after 1994, because the trees got so dense, all you see is trees. You can't you can't see the cliffs or the 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 you know granite or anything. So it doesn't make sense to look for a comparison since then. But but that that's exactly right. So that that's our changed fire regime. So in this case, we've removed something from the ecosystem. It's not a an organism, but it's a function, right? So we've removed function. And we see that with wetlands when we change the hydrology. We see that in forests when we when we change the um, uh, the fire regime and then that leads to you know all these the recent years that we're having and and uh, as you probably all know four of the five largest uh burn years in the history of california since we've been recording it we started recording that in 1911 four of the five uh most devastating wild years wildfire years both in terms of extent and in terms of fiscal damage have been uh four of the five of the worst have been in the last five years so this is just causing more and more problems. And we're not talking about fire in this lecture, but suffice it to say, this is what things look like in the 30s. And this example for us is well monitored for us in Arizona. You can see if you, if you can, there's a, a dude here, a tall guy, and he's touching this tree. So he can walk all around here, right? He can walk in, won't whack his head on a branch and whatever. Small fires, more frequent, relatively small fires have cleared out the underbrush and the vegetation below. So it's relatively just these large trees. This is, well, this is today, but this was, you know, about, 15, 20 years ago now, but, but the point being that, right, it's all clogged up. And we see that here. And so the visual representation of those pictures I showed you, this is the number of trees in this area over time, starting in about 1600 to modern, the modern time. And the trees have really um, increased, right? Um, the fires were very common. And then as those fires stop around 1900s, the amount of trees really spike again changing the functions so we're seeing this again so so figuring out what the reference condition the historical condition isn't isn't all it's it's non-trivial right um and so a uh, red maple for example is starting to become much more abundant across the eastern seaboard across thousands of miles because of our changed um uh, uh, management of uh our eastern deciduous forests here in california massive loss of oak woodland um, that we don't even really think about. But this is an example from up by San Luis Obispo. And in the, the picture was just, oh, some guys clearing some trees for farming. But look how massive that, I think it's a valley oak, look how massive that tree is, right? I mean, my God, it's, a, it's an oak tree. And just the main stem looks to be about, or main trunk, excuse me, looks to be about 40 feet high and, you know, about seven, eight foot in diameter, huge, right? Huge, we, we've had a massive change in these ecosystems. Here's another example of, of this notion of shifting baselines about what we expect to be normal or what we expect to be the default condition. So this is when I went up to do my postdoc at Stanford, um, I started working on grassland and oak woodland restorations and wetlands too. Um, and uh, I went to the library and this is something that, that's, uh, Maybe hard for you guys to envision since you guys do so much of your research digitally. But I went to this old archive and I was in charge of this, um, essentially this, uh, my postdoc was focused on restoring some land that the Stanford University controlled. It was essentially like, kind of like a research station, although it wasn't officially a research station, it was part of campus. It was these rolling hills that were part of campus. 
And so I didn't know anything about the campus. And so I went to, when I first got there, I went to the library. And how are we doing on time? Am I, am I getting too long-winded here? 9.48. Um, okay, good. Okay, cool. So um, I go in the library. It's like one of those Indiana Jones movies. I go in the library. It's the old library, cool library. It smells like dust and mold, awesome smells. And uh, I said, hey, can I get, I need the files on da-da-da. And the lady's like, well, I don't know. You can look on that. So I go to this old file cabinet. And I opened the file cabinet up and I, and I pulled out you kind of in hanging, uh, like sort of manila hanging things. I pulled out the folder and was looking at the stuff. And there was like some old jazz from the 50s and, the, you know, whatever. I'm like, okay, and I'm going through. And I pull out another folder, another folder. Then I noticed on the bottom, there was this folder that had fallen out of the other hanging folders, uh, this, this um, uh, binder that had fallen out. And I, and all, everything is, because you know it's Stanford, very well referenced or resource place. Everything is super well labeled and everything. And I pull this folder out, but it's not labeled. And I was like, "What the heck's this?" And you know, there's there's no reference to it or anything. And I open up, and it's these series of photographs that you see in front of you. So as um, Frederick Law Olmsted was designing campus, uh, that was designing this campus. This is the guy that did Central Park in in um, New York. Uh, he actually sent a photographer around to take some photographs. And what I found was, can you see this right here? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So these photographs are in a circle. This is like uh, we do structure from motion or do topography with drones, that kind of stuff, right? This was um, the late 1800s version of that. So somebody had taken a camera in the middle of this wetland. So where, where we're sitting here is a wetland that I was uh, trying to make sure there was still there still was a wetland to, it still is a wetland today has an endangered tiger salamander in it um and uh and we're you know, just working on making sure it stays a wetland stays healthy and everything um and this photographer had put plopped this camera down in the middle of it and pointed the camera due north you know this is the old like hey yo stand still you know the hood over the head kind of deal and then like you know the thing explodes and Take a picture of people. Um, so took it north and then twisted the camera, took it northeast, twisted the camera, took it east, etc. So the eight pictures here actually make a circular thing. And if you pull it around your head, it makes a perfect 360 view of what it looked like from that particular location in 1886. And it had just been lost for, I don't know, 100 years or fallen behind this thing. And so I was like, this is super cool. So for about a week, I was like super stoked that I, you know, I found the Ark of the Covenant or something. Um, but for the purpose of our lecture here right now, we're talking about baseline conditions. This wetland was considered, is considered degraded. So if you and I went there right now, no question, you would say, oh, there's weeds here, dude. <laughs> there's weeds. Um, the fresh, well, I don't know about anymore, but um, uh, there was a tradition where before the Berkeley football game is uh, students would get pallets and make massive piles of pallets in the middle of this depressional wetland area, seasonal wetland area, and set them on fire. I have these big, huge fire bonfires at night and, you know, rah, rah, go beat, go beat Cal Berkeley, right? Um, and then they'd leave and there'd be like, you know, um, nails and the refuse of stuff would be, I mean, it was, it was, they weren't, you know, actively trashing it intentionally, but, but there's all these impacts right, that you and I would go there and say, oh, this wetland is clearly degraded. In the context of our conversation right now about reference conditions, it's degraded, it's degraded. But check this out. So I, I've, I've blown it, I've zoomed in these three, these uh, the pictures on the bottom here just to, to give you a little bit higher resolution, but check it out. What do, what do we see? So, so from these three panels, tell me about what this system was like in 1886, or, or tell me any guesses that you, or, or, or insights or inferences you guys might be able to glean from this site in 1886. Looks like there was cattle. Absolutely, absolutely, massive amount of cattle. If you look closely at the bottom, there is no grass, there is no vegetation. It's all bare dirt, and 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 that's a perfect insight, which is. It, it's been trampled so much, right? So stomped so much by so many hooves. It, it's just, it's a dust bowl, basically. Good. What else? Well, what other, other evidence that things are, are different or, or, or tell me about the functioning of the system?
Okay, well, I'll help you guys out. So, uh, so check out, so another measure, or another indication that there's way, 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 way heavy pressure going on. Check it out. See this? Can you guys see this oak tree on the right, right here? Looks like yep. a mushroom. Yeah, looks like a yes. mushroom cap. There are no branches on the ground, right? There's no branches down here or down here or down here. That's how oak trees grow. Now, if you grew up in the city or suburbia where they've planted a bunch of oak trees, the term for those is usually street trees. When we plant trees in our backyards, when we plant trees along our roadsides, we don't want the branches sticking out into traffic. We don't want our branches uh, uh, you know, going into somebody's window, right? So when we're growing up those little baby trees in the, in the plant grow up facilities, any, anytime they start to throw off a little branch, we snip them, snip them, snip them, and we jam the plants super close to each other. So they grow towards the light. So they grow very quickly up and very straight. And then once you get to a certain level, we're like, okay, that's cool. Now, now, you, can, now you can sort of you know, expand at the top. But we don't like low branches. So this tree on the right looks like what you guys might think of as a typical, typical street tree or something. It's not. In this case, what's gone on almost certainly is the cattle are so abundant, the cattle have itches. Well, it's hot. Firstly, it's hot, right? So cattle are like, what the hell, man? So they, they'll go congregate underneath the shade in the hot summer sun, right? They'll chill out there. And then they have a little bit of itchy, itchy. And so they'll kind of, you know, uh, uh, they'll kind of, you know, scratch their back or their shoulder or whatever. And so whatever branches persist, it gets snapped off. So when you have very intense cattle or livestock operations, this is what the trees look like. Any, any, anybody see anything else? I know we're getting up to the break here. So that, that, that's good for now. That's good for now. So long story short, in 1886, and this, this area is called, we call it Lake Lagunita, even though it's, right, Lake Lake, but whatever. Um, so Lagunita here, it, um, it was nuked. This is a moonscape, man. If we want to talk about support for, you know, rare critters or stuff like that, this is horrible. This is like a feedlot on the five freeway alongside on Highway 5, right? I mean, this is crazy talk. So now, if we were to go there now, we'd see grass around, weeds and stuff too. But, but I would suggest that this notion of we want to make it look like it was when I was a kid. We want to take it to pre-disturbance levels. What defines that pre-disturbance level? And I would suggest that if I had not found this, these series of photographs, I think people would have said, you know, the way it was in 1930, you know, the way it was in 1910, you know, the way it was in 1950. The more we look oftentimes, the more we find that our human impact on these systems has extended for quite some time. So it can be hard to say what's the desirous condition. So if we wrote in the, in the restoration plan, we want to take this area to, you know, pre-1900 um, um, conditions or something, right? That would mean nuking the wetland, right? And so that's, that's problematic. So we need to be very careful with our, um, while it's fine conceptually to say we want to take it to this area, to, to this pre-disturbance level, we need to be very specific when we're talking about which time period, which metric, et cetera. And so then, um, let's see, am I going to, yeah, okay. So I'll, one, one or two more slides and we'll take our break. Um, so, so this is my shifted baseline. This is my sliding baseline. This is my personal problem with, with understanding what a healthy system is and therefore trying to figure out what the appropriate baseline condition would be. So this is, where, this is near where I grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And this is what I thought was a normal, healthy you know, California grassland, oak woodland kind of thing, right? Why? Because all the, or most of the hillsides around me look like this. So I now know that this is a massively altered system. This is a heavily grazed area. So this is, uh, the grass has all been mowed down by, by herbivores, cattle in this case. But the system, a healthy uh, in, in most situations, a healthy rolling foothills system would have many oak trees on it. But what's happened here are the ranchers have actively carved down, have actively chopped down all of those oak trees. 
Why? Because they believe, or historically believed, that those trees competed with the grass for resources, in particular water. So they thought if they had a bunch of trees, one, they would either shade the grass, there wouldn't be as much grass that would grow, or they would suck up a lot of the water that would otherwise go to growing grass. And the cattle can't eat trees, the cattle can only eat grass. So therefore, the answer is eliminate that part of the ecosystem. But because their cattle do need some type of refuge, right, from the hot summer sun or whatever, they leave a few of these focal oaks around, as I mentioned before, to provide shade. And so what I saw as my, ex, my shifted baseline of what is the, the natural distribution or abundance of this organism, in this case, oak, oak trees, I thought the natural thing was an oak tree and then a ways away, another oak tree, and then some distance past that, another oak tree, and then some distance past that, another oak tree. When in fact, that is a highly artificial, a highly disturbed, a highly modified system. Um, so again, unless we, it, it, it takes us crawling in and scratching in and spending extended time with our wetland, with our dune complex, with our grassland, with whatever it is to really understand how this system historically functioned. And in places like coastal California, where we've had a very, very heavy boot. That's a non-trivial thing to figure out, to figure out what, what, what the quote unquote predisturbance <clears throat> or the ideal condition could be or should be. Uh, and then I'll just wrap up this before we take our, our break here to say that um, this is, these are some of my best estimates of how much stuff has changed. So we have grasslands and oak woodlands as our example we just talked touching on here, and then wetlands down below. And this is um, basically since California became a state, so call it 1850, the, the 49ers basically. And we seem to, have, and so I have California overall than the San Francisco Bay Area because I was able to find better data in the San Francisco Bay Area because it was populated for so much longer, much harder in places like Ventura County or the Sierra Foothills. Um, and so, uh, so this day, San Francisco Bay Area is for the counties that touch the San Francisco Bay. And so in general, California's lost at least a third of the historic extent of grasslands that used to exist here. If we talk about an area we have higher resolution like San Francisco Bay Area, we've lost 60% of those grasslands. If we talk about grasslands that are dominated by natives or at least have very abundant natives, this would be things like serpentine grassland, um, bunch grass, uh, grassland, acela pulchra, things like that, type of pulchra. Um, uh, we've lost on the order about 93% of those um, ecosystems. Oak woodlands, very hard to estimate, very, very hard to estimate, but at least 10% of our oak woodlands are gone. Um, and in, again, area where we have areas where we have better data, uh, about 71% loss. In terms of wetlands, again, we've mentioned this before, but California, this is a factoid you should use a, a lot and, and cite it. Um, this comes from Dahl, uh, 1990. Um, uh, California has lost 91% of our historic wetlands. And we talk about San Francisco Bay Area, and here we're primarily talking about coastal wetlands, 95% loss. So all that really helps inform us and in, in, in frame our understanding of, of how the history and reference condition and, and background. Okay, I think we'll, we'll pause it there and we'll take our 10-minute uh, break. Gone on a little bit long, I apologize. We'll take our 10-minute break and I'll see you guys back here in 10 minutes. Ready, set, go. All right, everybody, we'll get going in about 30 seconds. I think I resumed our lecture. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so, um, okay, so then so just to finish this off, one last little slide. One last little slide in terms of this shifting baselines. Um, this is some data that I've compiled um, about coastal wetland loss up and down the Pacific coast. Um, we've lost about, about half of our wetlands overall, all wetlands in the US, in the low, and I should say in the continental 48, in the lower 48 states. Um, so about 48% loss in the 48 states. 
Um, if we look at the West Coast, some of these areas like Washington and Oregon have fared fairly well with about a third or so of their wet, coastal wetlands lost. Um, areas with more uh, intensely urbaniz urban urbanized areas or intensely modified areas like the Columbia River Gorge and the Columbia River Estuary uh, have a you know, concomitant greater loss. Uh, California, as we mentioned before, has an overall 91% loss of our wetlands. And as we talk about the different areas, it varies. Here in Ventura County, we're relatively uh, okay. We're relatively okay. We've, we've only lost you know, around half of our historic wetlands that used to exist 150 years or so ago, um, which is the reference point that I use for this. So I use I use the founding of the modern state of or, or, or the the you know the California becoming part of the U.S. as my as my uh, guide here because I had to pick something. But where we just were last week in Malibu, uh, you know, almost 90 percent of Los Angeles County wetlands were were nuked. And again, as we all know, as we mentioned before, that that does not mean that uh, in the case of California, it doesn't mean that 9% are healthy. It means this is just aerial extent, ab gross acreage of jurisdictional wetland. Obviously, the degraded functioning means that there's much less of this. Okay, so that's again, helpful to get us out of our shifted baselines and to make sure we're looking at these systems with open eyes and objective um, understanding. Okay, so let's look, uh, let's look here. This is, um, part of the northern, this is in northern, uh, northern San Francisco Bay Area, North Bay Complex. And this is the Sonoma Bay lands. So what do you guys think? Healthy wetland, well-functioning wetland, good, bad? What, what's, your, what's your take as you look across this landscape here? Guesses, initial thoughts. Uh, I'm feeling like maybe unhealthy. Uh, I've, driv I've driven past there and... I don't know. I, it didn't look the best when I went by. Okay, why? So, Chris, so why, what, what about this would tell you it's unhealthy or, or impacted? Uh, well, I, you can't really like, see it in the picture, but, like, when I drove by, like, the, uh, the embankments were all kind of, like, covered in, like a, like, a crusty sort of, like, not too great looking bubbly scum and, like, <laughs> I guess that like, is the best descriptor I could come up with it. And like, like someone said in the chat, like there really weren't any birds really like populating out there. Like I would have figured there'd be a lot of birds because it looks like a lot of standing water that they could wade through. Um, but, and like when you're looking around the edges, you just like that sort of heterogeneity again, it looks like it's basically just like the same thing, sort of, like creating a like fragmented perimeter around it all. Yeah, so, so what we're looking at are diked wetlands. So we're, we're looking at, at uh, it, it looks very linear. So first, this, this guy right, um, right here looks very linear. This other one right over here where, the, where the, you see the vegetation also very linear. And there's this one right here, which looks like, now, maybe it was the angle I took the photo or whatever, but it was, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, this, these are highly manipulated wetland systems. So, um, so there's, these systems have been intentionally changed by people for um, their own purposes. This isn't a, a dynamic system. One of the one of the signals is, I mean, look at look at how much open water. Not that we not that open water is bad. We're just at Malibu Lagoon. We have standing water there. So standing water inherently isn't bad, but when the standing water is in you know rectangles and big ponds, that should be a signal that mm, it's it's a little different. Now. Now, um, humans have been messing with this area for quite some time. So in the case of the San Francisco Bay Area, it was uh, oftentimes the Ohlone. These are on the, this is uh, some representations of the South Bay, South San Francisco Bay Area wetland complex. Um, but what do you see here? See some guy pulling out a reed canoe that's been built out of the tall vegetation on the edge of the marsh. And all around it, it looks like we've chopped down all this stuff. And then we have uh, an illustration from um, one of the uh, uh, first missionaries, first sort of European folks that were chronicling what was going on. And, and what do we see here? Well, we see on the right-hand side, we see in the back, or I should also say on the left, we all see tons of birds, right? So that it was, it was deemed important enough to put birds in the background. 
and then look on the one on the right. You see all those lines, all those birds in the air. It's just like waves and waves and waves of of um, migrating waterfowl or flying birds. So um, even though that wasn't the intention, uh, the, the drawing wasn't to document wildlife, we can sometimes get insights into the abundance or the, the commonness at times, or the perhaps the diversity of critters from some of these um, illustrations, which again, weren't necessarily designed to be a scientific record, but never, okay. So then, okay, so we see this in the back and then we see some coastal hills, right? Some, some, some near shore um, foothill type, type communities, okay. But then what do we get? We get in this big complex of tidal creeks, which are cool, more terrestrial areas, more, more you know, um, drier areas of the wetland. That's cool. We have some, some higher ridges of areas that we have higher, uh, uh, more um, biomass rich um, vegetation. But then check it out. Then when we get towards the, um, towards the water's edge, look, we have essentially this implies there's been large clearings made in the vegetation and the native peoples here have used that vegetation as um, structure, building materials basically for their, for their homes and their, their villages. So this certainly suggests that at least at the local scale, the native folks were having significant impacts on the abundance and distribution of some plants. When you go Sorry, yeah. oh, Joseph, you had a question? I think, I think maybe Joseph's unmuted or something, but okay. Um, and, but okay, so yeah, so, so here's evidence of, and, and the Ohlone were here for at least in this area doing this stuff for at least 4,000 years, at least, um, quite possibly longer. But, but, you know, we're talking about thousands of years of history of living with this system. So these folks had an intimate knowledge of, of critters harvesting things. And, and while this is one of those areas of active debates, um, at least when I was a postdoc, the, the thinking and the, the suggestion was the densest uh, population of pre-European Americans in the U.S. might have been in the San Francisco Bay Area. So the, abund the productivity was such that it, it supported like very large, relatively speaking, large populations um, uh, and things of that nature um, outside of the big cities of the Mesoamerican empires and stuff. But but uh, relatively high population centers were, were found in our California wetlands. Uh, and if we look up and down the coast, there's lots of evidence of pre-European settlement. So each of these orange dots that I put in here is a different um, uh, known um, Native American um, site where people persisted for some years. And so you see, as we go from the San Francisco Bay Area up there down to Santa Barbara, it's just you know all over the place in the coastal zone in particular. And as we as we look at our own area here, from Point Conception down to Santa Barbara, Ventura County, um, there's there's you know tons. And yes, there are absolutely settlements up in the we now we now consider those Padres Wilderness and things of that nature, the Chumash Wilderness, but. There's also the highest concentration is right there on the coast. The highest concentration is right there in our coastal wetlands. So these coastal wetlands that we're talking about, oh my God, people have impacted them. It's true, but people have been impacting them for quite some time. Now, the intensity of that, the amount of transformation might be different, but, but absolutely our native peoples um, were uh, capable of exerting influence on these ecosystems. Uh, looking a little more, a little more um, uh, recent than that, here is our uh, Magoo, uh, or here, here, here's our, here's the Ormond area, looking down at the Oxnard Plain, and already by 1945, I'm going to go into some more details of this, but I just wanted to illustrate this. So um, here is uh, looking down, we see Port Wainimi up there, we see um, uh, the transformation of the Oxnard Plain into different agricultural parcels and, and urban parcels. Um, here, and here's a, a photo from about 20 years ago, same idea, although, no, although now the, as you can tell from the area around um, the port here, 
which extended, you know, the urbanization extended a bit, you know, around, you know, inland from it. Now it's gone, you know, that, that area before was about to here. It's obviously intensely spread out as, as the city of Oxnard, Port Wanimi Oxnard has, has expanded. Um, and here we, and so again, this is, here we have Mugu Lagoon, right? Here's, here, campus is just, our campus is right here. But um, we have Cayugas Creek coming down here. Uh, we have, or so here's the Naval Station. Here is Ormond Beach is this area right over here. And when we talk about this reference condition, here is an overlay of a so-called T-sheet. So this is um, a fantastic resource that we have in coastal, in the coastal US, which was the desire of the young American nation to be, um, to protect its economic prowess. And that tied very tightly to international trade. So exporting goods, importing goods. Therefore, that meant that we had to have um, uh, really good navigation. We had to have working ports and harbors and things of that nature. Therefore, we also needed to know where the, where the navigational hazards were. So we sent around the, the coastal survey to do very, 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 very detailed maps of the shoreline, the immediate shoreline of the United States. And so whole folks spent their whole careers all around the country in a very detailed mapping effort to measure these systems. Now, while they were primarily worried about shipping things, so, so if there were rocks in the water, uh, where a safe harbor was, something of that nature, but they also, um, to the extent they could, and in places like um, right here on the Oxnard Plain, it's very easy to do because they could actually um, also go ashore. They could also go ashore on our relatively high local mountains and get an aerial perspective that in some parts of the coast that, that wasn't available to them. And so what they would do is they could, they would do these um, uh, uh, maps of the coast, but it would have some amount of information inland. And so for us talking about coastal wetlands, that's very useful. Now they didn't map, they weren't trying to map the entire extent of inland wetlands, but they were nevertheless, they were capturing certainly decent elements of it. And so what we see right here is this is an overlay. So we have our 2002 um, aerial image and then the red is that U.S. Coastal Survey um, map for all the parts that were indicated to be swamp or wetland? They use different terms, and so what we see here is the the red hash or the or the red uh, overlay is um, the wetlands extended at least that far when the map was when this particular map was generated in the mid 1850s. And so, what does that say? So check it out. So the the military base was full of uh, wetland. And we see more or less a continuous red blurb all the way up to the Santa Clara River estuary. So essentially contiguous wetland. Um, back to that in a bit. Um, getting back to the, our, our first theme here, is there a problem, right? So first we have, need to start measuring stuff, then we need to stop the problem and eventually heal the wounds, right? Um, the one thing I'll just say in the context of this conversation about measurement and understanding and value and stuff, um, uh, we want to stop the problem. Sometimes to stop the problem, to halt the worsening of things, we need to show justification for this. A really good monitoring can, um, framework, a really good effort of understanding what the background condition is, can actually help with this, can help you make the arguments. And while talking about the productivity of plants, might not be the most compelling thing in a city council, we can use, as we mentioned before, this notion of ecosystem services, which is a, a generally speaking, pretty powerful way to do this. Again, this ecosystem services is a term invented by my postdoc advisor. Uh, and uh, uh, for reasons we can talk about later, um, uh, intentionally maybe kept a few things a little bit vague. Um, and so by ecosystem services, we're referring to both functions and values. Again, the functions is the going on of the system. The value is the worth we as a, as a society ascribe to it. So examples of a healthy functioning wetland, coastal wetland like Magoo or Ormond or Malibu or whatever, 
could be something like the, all the examples you guys gave earlier, supporting stable populations, have high productivity, generate some biogenic structures like shade or sediment catchers or something like that. Um, a lot of our sediments form uh, metallo-organo complexes and that acts to um, help purify the water, help, help pull stuff, uh, nasty stuff out of the water and in effect act like a sponge and, and, and clean it. The value, so we talk about the, those functions, but sometimes in the city council meeting, people don't really understand maybe why is a biogenic structure all that helpful, right? Well, we could say, we could say a biogenic structure or you could say flood protection, or you could say storm surge barrier, or you could say hurricane buffer, right? So we could talk about the value of these functions, uh, like bringing bird watchers in, they're gonna spend money in your cafe. A high productivity, people can hunt and fish and, and you know, get some food for themselves, particularly in a time like now with COVID where people might be really close to the bone financially. Uh, and that could be really a key thing. Um, I mentioned erosion control a second ago. We could talk about pollution abatement, having cleaner water. Uh, so all those things are, are reasons we, we can use those as ways to, um, well, these in and of themselves won't staunch the problem, won't, won't stop the bleeding. These can be really helpful in convincing the powers that be to support the uh, stopping the stressor on the system. And the third part, as we mentioned, is just doing the actual restoration itself. So, so again, general approach is, is there a problem? Yes or no. If there is a problem, let's stop the problem. Once we stop the problem, then we can um, recover the function or, or repair, restore the system. Okay, uh, questions about that so far? Okay, so then let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, pre-restoration monitoring to help us frame the goals, to help us understand where we want to take our restoration and understand if, it, if, this, if site X really is degraded or not. Again, reminding us of our, our, our uh, important Hobbes and Norton diagram here, which is uh, ecological functioning on the left hand side, uh, age of the system on the, on the bottom axis, on the X axis, and the goal here is to have our, have um, the ideal goal would be to have metrics that one, distinguish the green from the pink. So distinguish reference site from degraded and to be maximally useful as we go through time, be able to look at the recovery trajectory. So be sensitive enough, not just that we can distinguish statistically green from pink, but that we can actually look at the, the um, time that we would be getting to the green. So we could say, hey, are we going to approach functional equivalency with a healthy system or a reference site or our desired condition? Are we going to fun approach func uh, functional equivalency in two years, five years, 20 years, 100 years, right? The slope of that curve so that we can figure out, um, one, if we're, if we're on track and if we're not, we can adapt much sooner and we can adjust our, our management. We can change our tactics to try to get to the green level sooner. Uh, so one approach we can take is to use, uh, see, I'll talk more about these, all these things later on in more detail, but just want to hit them really quickly. So one example would be uh, seed banks. So this thing, so this plant right here we're looking at, it's got these triangular leaves. I pointed it out last week. Does anybody remember what that uh, plant with that triangular kind of uh, arrowhead type of leaf was, the genus? It, it can grow into a big shrub. Did it start with the J? Ooh, Jaumea, good guess, but no. Start with an A. It was, so I stopped and I pointed out those plants and we were sort of- uh, Atroplex? Just, yes. Yeah, I was gonna yes. say that too. <laughs> Atroplex, nice, nice. So that's Atroplex growing right there. Um, there's actually, this may be, it's a little blurry. This may be Jaumea right in front of it, but it's a different one. I was talking about this guy. So there's some grass here, there's some atroplex, there's a couple different things. This is in, where did I take this picture? This is, I think, when I was doing some work up in uh, uh, Washington State, I think that picture is. Um, anyway, so, we, so one thing we can do, and if we were allowed to do our typical get together, this is an exercise we would have done this in our, in our class this, this semester, but uh, oh well, life's tough, um, is, is uh, do this collection. So what we do is um, we go out and we take cores, soil cores of the wetland, 
right now. This is the perfect time of the year. This is the exact right time of the year to do it. Um, we, we're not yet to the rainy season, so we want to get it before the rainy season. And what I've done here is I've taken a can, I've jammed it in the soil, and, and popped the soil out. So I've made a, essentially like a, a cake core, a, a, a core popped out of the um, ground, and I've kept that core in the same orientation. I've just put it in a little plastic uh, potting uh, pot and put it in the greenhouse. So we're in a greenhouse here. You can see the, the, the shelf around it, and just started watering it. And I first did it and there was nothing. The soil surface was bare. And so this is what it looks like. This is what this one particular site, this is from Leadbetter. Uh, shoot, where's Leadbetter? Um, oh, Leadbetter is a site up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, this is uh, one of the sites. And after a few days, look at there's a plant growing, there's a plant growing, there's a plant growing, there's a plant growing, plant growing, plant growing, plant growing, plant growing. And then this is what that this is what the cores from that collection look like on day 93. So it's a it's a it's a forest of stuff, right? And so so I could take the soil and I could sieve it all out and have you know you guys all spend you know I don't know 20, 30, 40 hours picking through microscopes and looking at seeds and then getting the seed and then taking the seed and going and looking up in a in a book and saying what kind of seed is this, etc. Or we can just take these cores and start watering them and wait for the plants to germinate when they're much easier to identify to, by species. Nobody has to use a microscope. And um, when we look at the seeds under the microscope, we don't, maybe, maybe some of those seeds are dead, right? Maybe they, they were not viable. So I don't know if a plant could have come from them. But in this case, we know that um, if they germinated, they were viable. So this is a measure of the, um, the seed bank. And so what the plants are doing in a wetland system. And this is one of my restorations at Magoo Lagoon. This is a little cartoon. I should, I should do a different version. Uh, like, you know, I'm supposed to be a professional uh, professor. Look at this. This looks like, this looks like an Atari game from 1980. What? Look at that. We should make this into an Atari game. Okay. So, um, so this is uh, a wetland restoration. This was, all the gray was nuked. And then we, we did our restoration to try to see if we could bring plants back. More on the details this later. This is a tidal creek. This blue thing is a tidal creek. So this is how the ocean water comes into this, this naked um, wetland plain right now. And what I'm showing you is the total concentration of seeds. And this, I, I've, I've creaked it. So the highest concentration is right here. So we see both in the, near the end of the channel, and actually you can't tell this, but as, as I go up this way, and as I go up this way, away from the creek, the elevation increases. So at the relatively high elevation at the back of the channel, we have tons and tons and tons of seeds relative to other, other places. So that's kind of cool. So that tells me something about the functioning. I did this restoration. Again, I collected, I didn't say again, but, but I collected these seeds before any plants were planted or anything was, was growing in this area of the marsh. So just after we did the physical sculpting of the soil to do our, as the first step in our restoration. And already, it seems to be working in the sense that already there are seeds coming in. And so the seed bank could tell us things like that. Uh, and uh, you don't need any statistics here. You don't need any math. This is one of my restoration sites. So here's the low site. Look, here's a pickleweed growing in here. Here's the sort of intermediary height where there's, there's some stuff. There's some stuff growing here and here. But then the rack line the relatively higher elevation area, check it out. There's this plant, we don't know what it is right now, but there's plant one, there's plant two, there's plant three, there's plant four, here's another atroplex, plant five, right? So the diversity and the density is highest in the higher elevation areas in the rack areas in this wetland. So that's a useful indicator, right? So we could take that, we could take that and go around and look at our sites now. We could go to some sites that we think are healthy wetlands, take some soil cores and look at how many seeds are in there in the seed bank of a healthy wetland. Then we can go to our restoration or, or maybe our, our site that we think is degraded, do some coring there and say, hey, does this have the same abundance? Does this have the same diversity of seeds in the seed bank? Yes or no. Then when we do our restoration, we could do this again and we can say, hey, is, is this seed diversity, is this, is this equivalent to, uh, to the reference site or is it not quite recovered yet? Right, so that's one example. Another another thing we could and again and so one this is both helping us 
plan for the restoration. It's also helping us understand if there is even the need for a restoration in the first place, right? So this is, we're still in sort of the first step. This, this can be used throughout, but it can also be used in the first step, which is, is there a problem? Okay, so we can do that with seed banks. Uh, here's another example. Uh, these pictures are also from Ormond. So this is, um, uh, this is uh, uh, insect productivity. Some of you guys have done this now because we've, we've adapted this technique that I, um, I invented many years ago uh, to um, uh, apply to our field methods and we can use it all over the place. So those of you that have been in field methods have been using this one. And this is just some sticky, uh, some, some fly, fly paper essentially, sticky plastic and look at the, the buildup of critters uh, on it. And this was part of a study we were looking to see if it messed with birds. So we had some tomato cages around the, around the um, uh, traps, but, but um, the point is these are traps out in the wetland collecting insects. And so one of you guys mentioned the notion of resistance, resistance to perturbation, resistance to invasion. We could use, we could do the same thing. Oh, actually this is, sorry, this is seeds. I, I think I have my slides out of order. So th this is seed bank data, sorry. Um, restoration, orange, reference site or, or purported reference site in green. Uh, the symbols are just different times, different, different, uh, different years we sampled, okay? And so uh, here's Biona wetlands by Los Angeles. This is Malibu Lagoon. This is our, one of our restorations at Magoo. This is another restoration. Of Mag this, is, this is Magoo as a reference site. And this is Ash Avenue, another one of our Restoration sites at Magoo. Um, again, uh, Elkhorn Slough up in the San Francisco Bay Area, Chrissy Field by downtown San Francisco, uh, Cogswell in the San East San Francisco Bay, uh, China Camp in Marin County, and then these are up in Washington State, uh, these, these sites. These are all references, these are not restorations. And so what we see here is this is the, this is, I'm showing you the proportion of the, all the seeds that germinated that were non-native exotics, so non-wetland native uh, seeds that showed up in here. And so if, if it was one, 100% of the seeds would be non-native. If it was zero, 100% of the seeds would be native uh, organisms. And what do we see? Well, we see um, our restorations start out. So let's look like at pilot restoration. When we first started, um, there were no seed, there were no invasives at all. It was all natives. So, and the same with Ash Avenue, right? Over time though, we, we lose some of that. Over time, we lose some ability to resist that invasion. And over time, the weeds start to come in, okay? But nevertheless, they're still relatively low, okay? They're relatively low. Um, oops, 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 oops. But compared to our reference condition, which might be this one here, right, in this case, compared to our reference condition, this guy is a uh, 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 pilot and ash after a while, they're not functioning as well as the reference. Okay, what about Biona? This, this area here, this is not, this, this column here, this is not a rest, well, eventually it became a restoration, but when I collected these seeds, it was not a restoration yet. This is just this existing wetland system. Check this one out. Holy cow, this one's almost 90% of the seeds were non-native. So this system is in the context of resistance to invasion. This one has lost any, or lost virtually all its ability to keep non-natives out of its system, right? Or, or to at least be dominated by natives. It's, it's really, the show is being run by the exotics. And so um, this site we would say is really screwed, yeah? Let's look at China Flat right here, this one. This is another uh, non-restoration site. This site seems to be functioning relative, in a relatively healthy manner, right? So this area does have relatively low levels of, um, of invasive seeds, of non-native seeds. Does that make sense? So this is how we can use these indicators and we might not know ahead of time. Is Biona a desirous reference site? It's a wetland. It's one of our few wetlands around, right? This guy right here. So do we want to use it as a reference site? I don't know. Well, let's go and do some pre-restoration monitoring and find out, right? Uh, and so when we start to do this, we can find out that, ah, not all quote unquote reference sites are equal. Some reference sites, good. Others, meh. Others, super lame. So we'd want to make sure that we wouldn't include one of these low level 
sites or, or low functioning sites as our as one of our reference targets because then we would be using as a rule stick a bad performance does that make sense you guys sounds good everybody's sleeping it's everybody's, everybody's okay, okay cool so um okay so uh uh, one last one I'll just say in terms of, I think last one in terms of the insects, and I guess I have one more, uh, is that um, uh, the reason we do these things, seeds in this, are, are the reasons why you might want to do these types of assessments. Again, there is no wrong uh, measure. DO is, is, is not bad or good. It all is gonna be relative to the needs of the particular site. Uh, the, the particular site, the amount of money you have, the amount of resources you have, et cetera, okay? Generally speaking, anything you can do cheaply and quickly is probably gonna be helpful because even in the sites where you have more money, you can do that. But in the sites or the systems where you don't have more money, you can't do some of the more uh, expansive testing. So it's usually best to have a range of metrics using a range of, of techniques, et cetera, but increasingly we don't have the luxury of spending lots and lots and lots of time. You and I, as, as people at a university, you and I could spend several years looking at something, but most folks don't have that luxury, right? Most restoration is not done by academics. Most restoration is done by consulting firms that have tight deadlines. They have a contract to make, they gotta make payroll, they gotta finish this project, go on to the next one. So they don't have the, the luxury of time. They don't have the luxury of if it messes up, just redo it next year. They have oftentimes one, one shot, a, a limited uh, a window. So when I first started working on grassland restorations up north, up in, up in San Francisco, um, uh, I wanted to look at the insects. And again, I, my background is as a marine biologist, coastal scientist. I, I didn't know much at the time about grasslands. Um, so there's a whole story there about how they hired me to restore grassland, even though I wasn't a grassland expert, but I can tell you that if you want later. Um, anyway, uh, so I wanted to know the insects. And I said, hey, I wanted to figure this out. And so I called up a local, actually emailed, a, a local museum that I won't identify, a very famous museum, where a lot of taxonomists live, right? Systematics fo folks, taxonomist folks tend to um, uh, be really, uh, well represented in museums, right? Research museums, natural history museums, things of that nature. So I called them up and said, hey, uh, I, I'm trying to figure out, I need, I need to do this project. I wanna enumerate all the insects, the insect community in my, my grassland here. And so um, I'm wondering if you can help me out or, or, or you know, kind of hire one of you guys for you know, a month or two or something to help me with this. Um, um, you know, you know, asking all these questions. And do you, have any, do you have any guides? We have a guide for California grasslands and we have a species list for California grasslands, you know, and all this and that. And I got back a really snippy email and here's an excerpt from it. So the excerpt says, and again, my, my asking the insect experts for help identifying insects in my, uh, my site that I'm trying to manage. And the email said, your inquiry is naive at best. If you really wanna do this, meaning monitor my grassland, you need 20 years and expansive funding, right? So that was a big middle finger to me that said, you're an idiot and you, you're so stupid. You don't even know how this works. Um, that is a huge part of the problem with restoration. Not me, but this person that sent this. Of course, we would all love 20 years of expansive funding to really understand the complete system. Never gonna happen, never gonna happen. And if we hold ourselves to that standard, we're never gonna get to restoring this wetland, this grassland, this forest, and the systems are gonna continue to degrade. So while I agree that would be an ideal thing, that's completely unrealistic. So we need to figure out ways of assessing condition, assessing health, determining reference condition functioning, uh, in a much quicker manner, in a much more um, useful manner, right? So I, I, would, I would, I think a little bit right now that, that we're all experiencing, maybe an analogy here is with testing for COVID, right? So uh, what happened, to remind everybody, uh, the, the um, WHO came up 
with its own own test for COVID, right? Very early on, within within the first uh, month or so of it really popping up in China. Use three different primers, three different three different parts of the virus to identify where it was coming from, uh, or so we could probably identify what the what the uh, what the if you had the virus, if you were infected with the virus. Um, the CDC, our CDC. Uh, Normally, a fantastic research, a fantastic organization, world standard, all that that great stuff, um, massively hobbled currently due to political interference and and things like that. But anyway, they said, no, no, we can do it better. We want to create a test that has four primers. Uh, it looks at four different aspect of the um, of the virus, and so we'll do it ourselves. Thanks, no thanks. We'll make our own uh, thing. And they screwed up, right? They had a contaminated source and that led us down the road of screwing up our, our testing and we've never recovered. We've since not recovered. We should have recovered if we were adults and actually using science and logic and facts, we would have recovered, but that's not where our national leadership is at the moment. The point being that the, the much of our testing at the federal level is focused on this type of approach on this 20 years and expansive funding using PCR approaches, very expensive. You need to have an expensive research lab, takes a long time, et cetera. Alternative approaches now exist. These are some of the ones that were used by the MBA in the, MBA, in the, in the bubble in um, Walt Disney World. And that is stuff like spit tests, you know, rub inside your nose, not all up to your brain. Not as accurate, okay? Absolutely not as accurate, but you get an answer in minutes or in an hour or so, as opposed to many, many days. And you don't need all the fancy um, PCR machines and all that, all that technology that you need, a, you know, a well-trained lab with all the expensive technicians to do that, right? And instead of the, the, the average test costing a hundred bucks or more with PCR, these types of quick tests cost more like a couple bucks, 10 bucks, something like that. And so, while of course we all want more accuracy, if you use the, the cheaper test, that's only about 80, they tend to only be around 80, 85% accuracy, right? Not as accurate as the uh, PCR tests, but you can do them a million, you know, so much more. You can do them much more rapidly. You could, do, you could be doing these every day before you go to school or whatever, right? And while any one test might be wrong, by doing that, that um, uh, repeated testing, because it's affordable, it's cheap, it's quick, you're actually getting better data. and We'd be actually much better able to determine outbreaks and we'd be able to much better be clamping down on this particular pandemic. It's the same thing here. So, so yes, of course, ideally it'd be great to have all this money, but we don't have that money. Let's figure out something that's gonna work for us in a rapid context that's gonna be affordable and effective and lead us to better outcomes and not be so bogged down by the academic types and the purists that say we we have to absolutely do do it this way, and so so we that's how, that's why we developed this technique basically. And so so we don't when we, we when we do our insect assays, and as you guys know that have taken field methods and done this, we don't necessarily do every single species to down to the species level, as maybe our 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 excellent colleagues at the museums would be able to do. Note. On this sheet, if I, if I got this and wanted everything identified, I'd have to pull off some of these insects, send them to Kansas. I'd have to pull off some of these insects, send them to UC Davis. I'd have to pull off some of these insects, send them to a museum in Oregon. Some of these insects to LA County Museum of Natural History. So the insect community is so diverse, there is usually not one person that knows everything. So we would take the grasshoppers and send those to the grasshopper experts. We'd take the bupresta beetles and send them to the bupresta beetle expert and, and, and all, all, you know, such and so forth. What we do is we look at stuff that lands on here and we look at morpho species diversity, gross stuff. Now we might call this species here the same as this, right? So for our, our quick assay, this, this quick insect sticky trap approach, maybe we call it the same thing. Now, it might prove, this might prove to be a different species than this, but in our quick assay, that's fine. We might have some focal things we really do wanna look at, maybe the butterflies we wanna identify to species or something. But the point is, we don't always have to go crazy intense intensity and be able to publish it in an academic journal, uh, you know, 
all the time to, to get useful information about these systems. And so what we, what we discovered also is that when we put these traps out, this is what you get. So these are covered with uh, 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 plastic saran wrap to, um, so that we can process them. But this is, a, this is an experiment out at uh, Ormond actually, where we've put the trap out and we've made the traps be different heights. And this is what we see. We see almost all the insects come close to the ground. Even though they can fly wherever they want, they almost all fly very close to the ground. So anyway, so um, we can use insects uh, to do this same thing. And so this is what we're looking at here. So this is, this is the number of insects in terms of richness and in terms of overall biomass, in terms of how far, when we get farther off the ground, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, when we're really close to the ground, there's not that much, but diversity goes up as we go higher and uh, productivity, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, richness increases as we get close to the ground and um, productivity increases as we get close to the ground. And so this is a mix of reference sites and restorations. So here the solid images, these are um, uh, reference wetlands and then the, the light blue X's, that's a, that's a a restoration site. And so we see they follow similar patterns overall, but there is there there are different clusterings in terms of the restoration, indicating that this, this pilot restoration is functioning somewhat differently than our um, wetland, than our restoration, than our reference, excuse me. Okay, another, so questions about that so far? So, we've, so we could use the, we've talked about parasites before, we could use seeds, we could use, um, uh, insects, right? Then we don't necessarily need to follow all the procedures that the system systematics folks would have us do or the plant experts. We can adapt these techniques to our needs in our sites. Cool? Questions? All right, and go a little bit and then we'll pause. Um, so the last example, uh, type of example we'll talk about in terms of understanding reference conditions or, or going about figuring out reference conditions is continue on this theme with with a quick assessment with a rapid assessment okay um, now the, the terminology that people have come to use has followed the federal epa's um, terminology that they put forward many years ago and this is the so-called tripartite approach to assessment we talked about the tripartite definition of a wetland right the the hydrology soils and vegetation this is their um, way of thinking of assessments for wetland. And this is now spread out to other systems beyond wetlands. But so, the, so tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one is uh, if we want to, so let's talk about this in the context of is our restoration, um, you know, are, are we getting reference condition level of functioning, right? So the first thing, the first level is very basic. The first level is if we're talking about a wetland, is there a wetland here? Right? Does this thing look vaguely like a wetland? You could do that by driving around. You could do that by looking at Google Earth. Right? So very quick and dirty, just you know, a little bit of time, maybe even from your desk. Tier two is a rapid assessment, which uh, takes more time than that, than, than just staring at your computer. It takes more time, um, but doesn't necessarily take hours and hours and hours, or excuse me, well, it might take hours, but it doesn't take days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks necessarily, right? So it's, it's um, relatively cheap, relatively fast. Tier three would be, again, what the kind of things that I do and you guys would maybe do in a capstone type thing where, where it's gonna be very expensive in terms of cost, in terms of time, it's not gonna be a, a quick you know, hour or two thing. It's gonna be months to years invested in monitoring. And, and, the, and tier three is really the gold standard. We would say this would be, like if we wanna do, you know, look at the abundance of, of spiders in the salt marsh or something, right? That would probably be a tier three type of, type of approach. The point here is that all three of these tiers have value, right? And they have value in different contexts. Historically though, we primarily said you had to do tier three. Right? You had to do the expensive uh, time investment, long-term monitoring, which is still great. Still love to be able to do that if we can. But again, resources being what, they, what they've been, the EPA began turning to this tier two or rapid assessment um, uh, 
several years ago and been and began encouraging folks to develop these types of methods. And so the um, uh, the the things that came out of this in terms of California wetlands is this thing called CRAM. CRAM stands for California Rapid Assessment Methodology. Okay, so. So the term doesn't have anything to do with wetlands, but it was first invented for wetlands. And now people have begun applying this. We apply this sort of, not this exact formula, but this approach, this general approach to our beach uh, assessments, for example. Okay, so right now we're looking at Ormond Beach. So is that good? Am I, am I making sense to you guys? I'm going kind of fast and we're getting near the break. Is it, everybody good? Yep. Yep. Is it making sense? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, so here, uh, so this blue guy right here, this blue, this blue rectangle, that's the, that's the edge of um, Magoo Lagoon, the edge of the military base, okay? Up here, this is uh, Ormond Beach. And while we haven't gotten to the history yet, suffice it to say there's a big power plant right here, if you've not been out to the site. Uh, and this is uh, where we, we call this, this site our, our Arnold Road. This, this area here is called Arnold Road. This is our Arnold Road area. And this is our Halico area. And so what Cram does is Cram says, um, instead of spending weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks or months and months and months and months out at Ormond counting plants and looking at insects and counting birds and stuff, rather we do a, a brief site visit. We do a little bit, of, little bit of stuff on our computer before we go out, just look at the map and see what's going on. And then we go out for a, a very brief visit, could just be an hour or so. And we have essentially a, a, a checkbox type of an approach. And we have all these different categories. It's like filling out a survey. Did we do X? Yes. Okay, it was X one, two, or three level of functioning. Do we have a lot of invasive plants, a little, you know, that type of thing. And so this is what we do. So we go out and uh, we do some things ahead of time. And so we pick a site, we're gonna go monitor here, say in the center of this bullseye, and we draw some, uh, uh, bull, some uh, uh, para um, we buffer that area and we ask things like, are there a bunch of roads around here? Are there, are there um, things in this area that we do using Google Earth, okay? Then we go out there and we look in just these little target areas and we do this sort of checkbox type of an approach. Do we have this? Do we have that? Do I see this present? Do I not see that present, et cetera? We come together. And those of you that are working in Capstone, those of you that are working on our beach index, our beach health index, this is the same idea as what you guys are working on. Um, and so we have some measurements here talk about the geomorphology, some measurements here talk about the uh, plants, uh, et cetera. And we come together and we get a score. Um, and so uh, we've been monitoring a bunch of these sites all around, but uh, I don't need to talk about that. Okay, so this is what we see. So this is the score, okay? So the scores go from high to low. Uh, we have different components. So this blue is a measure of the hydrology of our coastal wetland. Um, the red is the, oh, sorry, the, the green is the biology. The black is the landscape. So things like connectivity, stuff upstream, stuff downstream, et cetera. Those three things come together to produce the aggregate CRAM score, which is this red, uh, these red diamonds here. And what I'm just showing you is these are a bunch of sites that we've monitored going from uh, Carpinteria in Santa Barbara County down to uh, Malibu in um, where we were last week. And so what do we see? Well, we see that different sites, some of these are, are reference sites, some of these are restoration sites. What we see is the values vary, right? So this orange value, uh, which is um, the, the physical conditions, change for, they range from 100, a value of 100% to something like about 40%, okay? The overall score ranges, in, in our parts of the world, ranges from about 90, a little bit less than 90, uh, to uh, the lowest is right here at 12, well, the time we did this, was it's changed a little bit since, but, but at 12th Street. So we can use these scores to, to get a sense of um, where are the outliers, right? Or, or let, me ask, let me ask you that. Actually, this will do. 
and we'll take a break now, but I want you guys to stare at this for a second. And my question is, how might we use this, this, this score here, what's, what's laid out in front of us, how might we use this to figure out which sites we should use for reference or how, how we might determine if a site is um, well-functioning or not, okay? So I'll leave this up for a minute or two and we'll, take, we'll start our 10 minute break. And after a minute or two, I will go, uh, uh, I'll actually pause this and I will go uh, get a drink of water and I will see all of you in 10 minutes. Cool beans. Okay, so um, so thoughts about this? Thoughts how we might um, thoughts how we might use this data in a a context to figure out um, condition to, to define what references or background conditions are or stuff of that nature. I mean, I would say that if you look at any of these sites and you see a pattern with each of the respective variables, like if they have, you know, a, a high point, but then it drops, um, I feel like that's maybe a site that you would, that you would look at. Okay. So, so Dana, so you're talking about, you mean over time, you mean over like time. if you looked at it in 2000 and then 2001, 2002 and see it change, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, I don't see the, it might just be my computer, but I don't see the year. All I see is the score. So like, you know, Carpinteria looks okay, but yeah. I would say that Ormond has like a steep, you know, it has a high point for certain variables and then they, they drop. Oh, rapidly. I got you. So okay. Say, yeah. yeah, sorry. So I apologize. To be clear, this is just from one year. This data isn't multiple okay, years. It. This data is just one time. But yeah, okay. So, oh, well, that makes sense. so Dana is talking about, uh, so this site this is Carpinteria, but we don't even, doesn't matter. It's just the orange site. We call it the orange site for right now. Orange site, the stuff is, is fairly close, right? The orange is, the orange value, the um, physical value is about 100 to 80 something. The overall value ranges from about 89 to, I don't know if this is 86 or something, right? The hydrology seems to be identical. The biotic seems to be identical. So in this particular site, granted we only have an N of two, but, but they seem very uh, uh, sort of consistent story. Maybe we can say it like that, a consistent story. Whereas if we look at Magoo, now again, Magoo's got a mix and you can't tell from this, but some of these, like, like these ones here are restorations, others are not. But, but if we just assume these are, let's just play the game and say these are all not restorations. These are all um, um, reference or candidate reference sites. What Dana's saying is here, there's huge range. So if we take the blue, for example, blue's ranging from as a low of about 25, um, oops from about 25 up to 100, right? So a hu huge variation. So blue has a lot of variation in it. So either maybe we wouldn't want to pick blue, the, the, the Magoo site, or we'd want to pick a subset of the Magoo sites that seem to be behaving more similarly, possibly. Okay, that's a good idea. Other people, others, other thoughts or other suggestions? Uh, just going to comment that there's a lot going on in sure. this particular graphic. Sure. So how might, but, but I totally agree. Um, but I'm trying to get more at the conceptual approach here. So Dana was saying that maybe we could use sites that are, that have a, a, a consistent level as, as a measure of, or with maybe some increased confidence that maybe that level is a desirous thing. Other ways we could use, you know, data like that. And then well, I'm showing you CRAM data, but it doesn't have to be about CRAM. This could be seed data. This could be productivity data. This could be any data, right? I'm just trying to say, how might we define what is the target site? What is the reference condition? How do we, how might we do that? I don't know if anyone brought this up yet, but maybe taking an average for each of the sites when everyone has the highest average per thing that we're looking at, that could be a reference. Excellent. Excellent. So, so one approach is an averaging approach, which is totally a fair thing to do. The other that we first had was um, the variance, right? L looking at more about um, how noisy it is. So one, we could talk about the central tendency of the, of the value. One, we could talk about the spread of the values. So cool. Good. Other ideas? Uh, you can start from like it backwards. So you can choose the sites that are bad and you can see what is wrong with those sites and 
work around making sure that you don't do those mistakes. Yeah, totally. So yeah, excellent. So maybe we'd say, uh, it, well, so firstly, you know, I guess by definition went to a bad site, let's say this, this low value here of, of the aggregate score, the uh, 12th, this is 12th street South. Um, we could say that, that, that that's a poor level of functioning. So we definitely would consider that if we got that level, maybe that would be a failure. Um, but then we could actually go to the site and say, why is it a failure, right? So, so um, uh, one of the values of the CRAM approach, since we have, we get a number. So the goal of CRAM is to get this red number or this, this uh, uh, red diamond number. Um, but the number itself is always comprised of the subcomponents, right? So this red, this red here is a number we get from the orange and the green and the blue and the black. Yeah. So we can look at some of these sites and let's check it out. So it looks like, like uh, J Street, the J Street restoration. You guys can see my cursor, right? When I do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so this particular site, so check it out. The blue, the black, the green, again, it's not important what they are at this point because we're just talking about subcomponents, but these subcomponents look fairly similar to each other. Yeah. Whereas the orange is the outlier. So the orange is pulling this dude down, right? Is pulling red down. And if we look, the blacks are kind of similar. The blues are kind of similar. The, the greens are kind of similar, but the orange seems to be the real, the real issue. So in the case of these three sites, um, yes, we can use the aggregate score, but that actually, so the equivalent of going out there and looking at it, which is a great thing, we can also, in the case of something like this, where we have a, a score that's comprised of components, what's the component that's causing the biggest problems? In this case, it's a physical aspect. So there's something about this particular, the, the physical array of the landscape in this particular site that's driving this poor performance. So we might want to go out and look and, and not follow that, not follow the contours or not follow the shape or not follow the array of, of items in the landscape the way they are in J Street, because that, that seems like it's not, not ideal. Good. Other ideas or other thoughts? Or guesses or half-baked half ideas or whatever? Okay, okay. So this is one, one way you can do it, right? So, so I, I, liked, I liked all the stuff that you guys suggest and I'm not meaning to say that there's any one always correct way or one always incorrect way. But here's, here's what an approach that, that I took to, to dealing with this stuff. So a range of things. So here we have, <clears throat> Um, uh, yeah, for the, the for point of this, it's, it's just a range. So here's a cram score. Again, go from high to low and uh, not knowing anything. So looking at this, hey, what, what's a reference site? What's a, what's a strong performance? What's a bad performance? Don't know. One thing you can just do is collect sort of a shotgun, you know, multiple sites, say like we've done here, and then we can just put them up and, and just essentially just taking all these red, um, red values basically and put it in, and plopped them together. And so check it out. So here there's some that are relatively high. There's some that are obviously very low. And then there's some in the middle. So now we could do something, but, but, they're, but they're more or less contiguous, right? I mean, if we look at this, there isn't, it's not like there's a bunch up here and there's a bunch down here, which would be easy, right? If we had that, it'd be, oh yeah, let's call that, let's call, call that relatively high function, relatively low function. Instead, what we have is this just gradual transition, right? M much of the stuff is in the middle. There's a few high, there's some low. And so uh, what we've done is we've just put it up here and we've arbitrarily, um, I mean, you can use some, some simple rules, but basically it's arbitrarily made a cutoff. So we're gonna call this high performance. We're gonna call this failure or low performance. We're gonna call this somewhere in between. Now, what we can therefore say is the goal of the restoration is the high performance. Okay, that's what we're targeting. We're targeting high level, but check it out. Most of these sites are not 
you know, nobody in, th in this particular data set, nobody has above a score of 90. So that says that the goal maybe shouldn't be, you know, perfect functioning, right? If we're using the other existing sites in 2020 as our guide, maybe none of them have, have perfect functioning. So we could say, screw it. I want 100% perfect functioning. That's our goal. But realize if you say that, that's going to be very costly. And we have no models, which we don't necessarily have a model or a pathway to get there, right? Maybe some of the Maybe some of the functioning we need isn't, isn't possible now with climate change. Maybe some of the functioning isn't possible now with the fragmentation or the loss of, of some of our threatened or rare species, right? So maybe it makes much more sense to say, you know, our target is 90% level of X, right? And so that's a realistic thing. And we can talk to the community, we can talk to the funders and say, look, we're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to do the best we can. We're trying to do a realistic approach to this. We're still having high standards, don't get me wrong. We're not, I'm not saying make it 50%, but it's not just some arbitrary 100% natives, zero exotics. You know, it, it's not that kind of extreme. It's rather guided by the reality. And you'll get a lot more buy-in and it's also much more realistic. If we targeted, check it out, if we targeted 100% functioning here, every single one of these wetland sites would be fail, a failure, right? And that, I don't know if that's the right, I, I would posit that's probably the wrong approach to follow for restoration, right? We understand that we're not gonna get it right and we understand we're, we're learning this, but to set impossible goals is maybe not the best way forward. Okay, so, so one, we can use this data to set you know, the target, the goal, the ideal. The other thing we can do is we can say clearly at this level, this is unequivocally a failure at this low level. This is, this is, this is bad, right? We're observing this in nature right now, but this is not a good thing. And uh, what we could do is then we could actually create some intermediary range. So we could make not, not the, um, so maybe the goal might be, you know, uh, we could say something like, you know, 89, a score of 89 is considered the target. But we could also say a range. So we could also say something like the goal of the restoration, or we believe a well-functioning system in coastal Southern California at this point is a site that has a CRAM score of 79 or higher, right? So there's this green zone, right? This green zone. Or we could say something like 79 to 89 or, or something like that, right? And we could say a, a a clear, clearly unacceptable level of functioning is, I don't know what this is, 55, a, 50, a, a cram score of 55 or lower, right? So if we get that, mm, ain't, we won't be satisfied. That's, that's not ideal. But it also says we have this, between the, the target or the ideal and between the outright failure, there's this other area. There's this, there's this intermediary zone, right? And so we could either say that's acceptable, or maybe we could say, give it a, a time step. Maybe we could say that um, this is a desirous range for year two to five, right? As the system comes online, as the babies grow up, as the plants grow up, as the hydrology evolves, right? And so, so again, with that, that notion of distinguishing high from low and the notion of, are we on the right trajectory? So yes, it, it might be true that, um, I don't know what this number is right here. It might be true that um, 68 is not you know, perfect functioning, but 68 is certainly better than the low performance. And as an intermediary step, maybe that's okay. So again, by having more precision and by, by measuring um, what the de degradation is, what the health is, what the functioning is, we can be much more specific about this and help ourselves and the community and the funders and everybody better understand and come up with more realistic plans for how to go about restoring this. In addition to being realistic, this provides much more um, um, specific guideposts for those of us that are actually implementing the restoration, right? So if we're trying to go from zero functioning to 100%, you 
you know, in year one, you know, good effing luck, right? That's, that's a tough haul. But if instead we have starting at low, going through some transition period, getting to this after a certain amount of time, that's a much more realistic thing. We can plan the watering, we can plan the planting, we can plan the manipulations, et cetera, to fit within that in a much more realistic fashion and something that would, that would be um, a practicable. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so that, that's, that's but one approach. I'm not saying this is the only approach, but, but this is the way once we start to have data, once we start to be much more specific about what we mean by history, once we start to be much more specific by what we mean by reference, then it, 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 it gives us a lot of help. The tendency historically is for folks to not do this, right? The tendency is don't, 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 don't give me any specifics, right? Don't, don't, uh, mm -mm, no, mm, no because I don't know how to do this. And if you give me a specific target or a specific value to hit, there's a good chance I might, I might not make it. So therefore, don't hold me to a standard. This whole approach here is the opposite of that. This whole approach is saying, no, 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 we need standards. Not to say you're an a-hole, not to say you're a, an idiot, but to simply provide us uh, uh, milestones, road markers, guidelines, guideposts to get to where we wanna be. The more precise guideposts we have, the better we'll be able to design, the better we'll be able to monitor, and in the context of today's conversation, the better we'll be able to determine whether this site is um, uh, you know, functionally equivalent to another site or, or, or functioning at an acceptable level. Cool? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, one other thing I wanna mention here uh, is that, uh, Another thing that we, nobody, nobody mentioned, but I just wanted to say this. The approach that we've historically taken is exactly what you guys talked about. Carpinteria is, the, is a reference site. You know, maybe Magoo isn't, or these parts of Magoo aren't a good reference site. That's totally fine. Another one is um, in, in areas like here in coastal Southern California, where we have many stressors, where the stressors are mounting, where we've tweaked the system historically for a long time, what we're, what we're being implicit about in terms of our assumptions is that there is such a thing as a reference site, that that thing exists. That there's this sort of ideal, you know, kind of, hallelujah, you know, sitting in the, in the gold clouds glowing and it's the perfect thing, you know? And it'd be wonderful if we had those, but oftentimes we don't. But what we might have is check it out. Let's look at Carpinteria right here. Check out this, the physical condition of, Carpenter, of, of the west end of Carpinteria. Man, that, that's a 100% score. That's kick butt, right? That's awesome. Check it out over here at Magoo, the place we said is highly variable, but check it out. We have some of these, some of the spots of Magoo where the hydrology is super kick butt, right? So it's also possible to have our reference site for the physical conditions could be site one. The reference site for the fish might be site two. The reference site for the soil conditions might be site three. The reference site for the water quality might be site four. So again, I'm not saying you have to do that, but realize in a, in a system where we don't have a lot of fantastic, um, undisturbed, uh, relatively intact systems, sometimes we have to do a bit of a potpourri type of approach, a bit of a mix and match. So there's no reason why we couldn't do that. There's no reason why we can't say, hey, this component of the system is doing well in this site, so we're gonna use that dimension of this site to guide us. This other component in a completely different, different location um, is, does better here, and we're gonna use that for guiding us in terms of that component, right? So these are all possibilities that you can dip into as you need in different projects. Okay, uh, next I just wanna say, so I, okay, I'll say that I, I was skeptical of this approach. I, I, I thought, so some of my grants that I got um, from the EPA and some of my research, I was required, I was required to do this and I was, uh, <laughs> I was not happy because I was like, what do I want to do this, man? I want to go count my plants and everything. Oh, it's stupid. <laughs> but, but the deal was the EPA said, hey, if you're going to do this, yes, do all your research, 
but also take a little bit of time and do do a cram score for these things. And I was like, you're stupid. This is lame. Stop telling me. Stop controlling me. Right. Um, but I did it. And to my chagrin, this is what I found. Or, or, or I mean, there's lots of examples. There's just one, 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 um, one visualization of this. Okay, so this is pitfall traps. So this is another way we measure insects by putting out traps, leaving them out for a few days, pulling them back into the lab, and then identifying critters and measuring them, sort of traditional research that we would uh, do, right? Traditional ecological monitoring. And this is expressed as the grams of productivity per trap per, per five days. Uh, here's the cram score. So the cram, so again, this is, this is uh, you know, several hours of going out, deploying these traps, uh, and then coming back uh, with several people, and then coming out, um, you know, several days later, five days later, with several people pulling them back, right? Logistically, it's an issue. We have to have equipment, have to have jars, have preservatives, you know, da -da -da -da. then transporting these items back to school, back to the lab at school, then spending many hours for each trap, processing them, going through, measuring, weighing, counting, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So good stuff, great data, but a lot of time, a lot of person hours, right? A lot of person hours. Cram is for any one site, and, that, and that's for one site, right? To do multiple sites, then we have to go, you know, multiply that by how many sites we're doing. For cram, it's, you know, an hour or so on the computer ahead of time. It's driving out to the site for a, you know, uh, call it two hour visit or so, something like that, right? And then come back and maybe maybe an hour worth of typing in data and adjusting, right? Massively less investment, okay? And this is what we found. So here's these different sites. And essentially what we found is as cram score goes up, productivity goes down. And so don't, not to get into this, happy to talk about why this happens as opposed to going up. But the point is, this is a significant correlation. It might not look like it because there's this orange ormond up here, but, but there's a, a significant relationship here. So that the cram score is correlated in some way, shape or form to the pitfall traps. In other words, this, this high traditional research, this tier three type of, of, of data collection correlates with this tier two version. Is it the same thing? No. Is there variance? Yes. Do we get additional benefits by doing the more intensive research? Yes. But, but if we're on a limited budget, check it out. We can get at least at the gross, gross level, we can get at the same, we're getting at the same thing for a lot less time, a lot less effort. So that's really valuable. So I, after doing this, I became, I, I'm no longer a skeptic of the value of these types of rapid assessments. And again, I was very, I was very skeptical in saying that this is this is baloney. This is this is silly. Okay. Questions about that? Questions about that uh, uh, um, exciting stuff about uh, monitoring and thinking about reference sites and what is healthy and what is functioning? Uh, so on that last slide. Yeah. With the. Uh... Talking about the core.